Book 9. So the Trojans held their night watches. Meanwhile, in mortal panic, companion of cold terror, gripped the Achaeans, as all their best were stricken with grief that passes endurance. As two winds rise to shake the sea where the fish swarm, Boreas and Zephyros, north wind and west, that blow from Thraceward, suddenly descending, in the darkened water is gathered to crest, and far across the salt water scatters the seaweed, so the heart and the breast of each Achaean was troubled. And the son, the son of Atreus, stricken at heart with the great sorrow, went among his heralds the clear spoken and told them to summon calling by name each man into the assembly, but with no outcry. And he himself was at work with the foremost. They took their seats in assembly, dispirited, and Agamemnon stood up before them, shedding tears like a spring dark running that down, like a spring dark running that down the face of a rock impassable drips its dim water. So groaning heavily, Agamemnon spoke to the Argives. Friends who are leaders of the Argives and keep their counsel, Zeus, son of Kronos, has caught me badly in bitter futility. He is hard. Who before this time promised me and consented that I might sack strong Lydillion and sail homeward? Now he has devised a vile deception and bids me go back to Argos in dishonor, having lost many of my people. Such is the way it will be pleasing to Zeus, who is too strong, who before now has broken the crests of many cities and will break them again, since his power is beyond all others. Come then, do as I say, let us all be won over. Let us run away with our ships to the beloved land of our fathers, since we no longer now shall we capture Troy of the wide ways. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken to silence. For some time the sons of the Achaeans said nothing in sorrow, but at long last Diomedes with a great war cry addressed them. Son of Atreus, I will be the first to fight with your folly, as is my right, Lord, in this assembly. Then do not be angered. I was the first of the Danans whose valor you slighted, and I said I was un and I and said I was unwarlike and without courage. The young men of the Argives know all these things, and the elders know it. The son of devious devising Kronos has given you gifts in two ways. With a scepter he gave you honor beyond all, but he did not give you a heart. And of all power this is the greatest. Sir, sir, can you really believe the sons of the Achaeans are so unwarlike and so weak of their hearts as you call them? But if in truth your own heart is so set upon going, go. The way is there, and next to the water are standing your ships that came, so many of them, with you from Mycenae. Mycenae. And, the, and yet the rest of the flowing Heracians will stay here until we have sacked the city of Troy. Let even these also run away with their ships to the beloved land of their fathers. Still we too, Stesthenelos and I, will fight till we witness the end of Ilion. For, his, for it was with God that we made our way hither. So he spoke, and all the sons of the Achaeans shouted a claim for the ward of Diomedes, breaker of horses. And now Nestor, the horseman, stood forth among them and spoke to them, Son of Tydeus, beyond others you are strong in battle, and in council also are noblest among all men of your own age. Not one man of all the Achaeans will belittle your words, nor speak against them. Yet you have not made complete your argument, since you are a young man still, and could even by my own son and my youngest born of all. Yet still you argue in wisdom with Argive kings, since all you have spoken was spoken fairly. But let me speak, since I can call myself older than you are, and go through the whole matter, since there is none who can dishonor the thing I say, not even powerful Agamemnon. Out of all brotherhood, outlawed homeless shall be that man who longs for all the horror of fighting among his own people. But now let us give way to the darkness of night, and let us make ready our evening meal, and let the guards severally take their stations by the ditch we have dug outside the ramparts. This I would enjoin upon our young men, but thereafter do you, son of Atreus, take command, since you are our kingliest. Divide a feast among the princes, it befits you. <coughs> it is not unbecoming. Our shelters are filled with wine that the Achaean ships carry day by day from Thrace across the wide water. All hospitality is for you. You are lord over many. When many assemble together, follow him who advises the best counsel. For in truth, there is need for all Achaeans of good close counsel. Since now close to our ships, the enemy burn their numerous fires. What man could be cheered to see this? Here is the night that will break our army, or else will preserve it. So he spoke, and they listened hard to him, and obeyed him. And all the sentries went forth rapidly in their armor, gathering about Nestor's son, Thracemedes, shepherd of the people, and about Ascalaphos, and Elamnos, sons both of Ares, about Meriones and Epharephraeus and Dipraeus, and about the son of Creon and Lycomedes the Brilliant, 
There were seven leaders of the sentinels, and with each one, a hundred fighting men followed, gripping in their hands the long spears. They took position in the space between the ditch and the rampart, and there they kindled their fires, and each made ready his supper. But the son of Atreus led the assembled lords of the Achaeans to his own shelter, and set before them the feast in abundance. They put their hands to the good things that lay ready before them, but when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, the aged man began to weave his counsel before them, first Nestor, whose advice had shown best before this. He, in kind intention toward all, stood forth and addressed them. Son of Atreus, most lordly and king of men, Agamemnon, with you I will end, with you I will make my beginning, since you are lord over many people. And Zeus has given into your hand the scepter and rights of judgment to be king over the people. It is yours, therefore, to speak a word, yours also to listen, and grant the right to another also, when his spirit stirs him to speak for our good. All shall be yours when you lead the way. Still, I will speak in the way it seems best to my mind, and no one shall have in his mind any thought that is better than this one that I have in my mind, either now or long before now, ever since that day, illustrious, when you went from the shelter of anger to Achilles, taking by force the girl Briseis uh, against the will of the rest of us, since I, for my part, urge you strongly not to, but you, giving way to your proud heart's anger, dishonored a great man, one whom the immortals honor, since you have taken his prize and keep it. But let us even now think how we can make this good and persuade him with words of supplication and with the gifts of friendship. Then in turn, the Lord of men, Agamemnon, spoke to him. Age, sir, this, this was no lie when you spoke of my madness. I was mad. I myself will not deny it. Worth many fighters is that man whom Zeus in his heart loves, as now he has honored this man and beaten down the Achaean people. But since I was mad in the persuasion of my heart's evil, I am willing to make all good and give back gifts in abundance. Before you all, I will count off my gifts in their splendor. Seven unfired tripods, ten talents weight of gold, twenty shining cauldrons and twelve horses, strong race competitors who have won prizes in the speed of their feet. That man would not be poor in possessions, to whom were given all these have won me, nor be unpossessed of dearly honored gold, where he given, were he given all the prizes these single-foot horses have won for me. I will give him seven women of Lesbos, and work of whose hands is blameless, whom when he himself captured strong founded Lesbos, I chose, and who in their beauty surpassed the races of women. I will give him these, and with them shall go the one I took him took from him, the daughter of Briseis. And to all this I will swear a great oath, that I have never entered into her bed, and never lay with her as, as is natural for human people, between men and women. All these gifts shall be his at once, but again... If hereafter the gods grant that we storm and sack the great city of Priam, let him go to his ship and load it deep as he pleases with gold and bronze when we Achaeans divide the war spoils and let him choose for himself 20 of the Trojan women who are the loveliest of all after Helen of Argos. And if we come back to Achaean Argos, pride of the tilled lands, he may be my son-in-law. I will honor him with Orestes, my growing son, who is brought up there in abundant luxury. Since I have three daughters there in my strong-built castle, Chrysothemis and Laodike and Apinesa. Let him lead away the one of these that he likes with no bride price to the house of Peleus, and with a girl I will grant him as a dowry many gifts, such as no man ever gave his da gave with his daughter. I will grant to him seven citadels strongly settled, Cardamile and Anope, and higher of the grasses, Bere the Sacrosanct, and Anthethia deep in the meadows, and Epia the lovely, and Pedasos of the vineyards. All these lie near the sea at the bottom of sandy pylos, and men live among them rich in cattle and rich in sheep flocks, who will honor him as if he were a god with gifts given, and fulfill his prospering decrees underneath the scepter. All this will I bring to pass for him, if he changes from his anger. Let him give way, for Hades gives not way, and is pitiless, and therefore he among all the gods is most hateful to mortals. And let him yield place to me, inasmuch as I am the kinglier, and inasmuch as I can call myself born the elder. Thereupon the draining horseman Nestor answered him, Son of Atreus, most lordly and king of men, Agamemnon, none could scorn any longer these gifts you offer to Achilles the king. Come, let us choose and send some men who in all speed will go to the shelter of Achilles, the son of Peleus. Or come, the men on whom my eye falls, let us take the duty. First of all, let Theonix, beloved of Zeus, be their leader. And after him take Aias the great and brilliant Odysseus. And the heralds let Odios 
and your abates go with them. Bring also water for their hands, and bid them keep words of good omen, so we may pray to Zeus, son of Cronos, if he will have pity. So he spoke, and the word he spoke was pleasing to all of them. And the heralds brought water at once and poured it over their hands, and the young men filled the mixing bowl with pure wine, and passed it all, passed it to all, pouring first the libration and goblets. Then when they had poured out wine and drunk as much as their hearts wished, they set out from their shelter, from the shelter of Atreus' son Agamemnon. And the Geranian horseman Nestor gave them much instruction, looking eagerly at each, and most of all at Odysseus, to try hard so that they might win over the blameless Pelion. So these two walked along the strand of the sea, deep thundering, with many prayers to the holder and shaker of the earth, that they might readily persuade the great heart of Achilles. Now they came beside the shelters and ships of the Myrmidons, and they found Achilles, delighting his heart in a lyre, clear-sounding, splendid and carefully wrought, with a bridge of silver upon it, which he won out of the spoils when he ruined Etion's city. With this he was pleasuring his heart and singing a men's fame, as Patroclus was sitting over against him alone in silence, watching Achilles and the time he would leave off singing. Now these two came forward as brilliant Odysseus led them and stood in his presence. Achilles rose to his feet in amazement, holding the lyre as it was, leaving the place where he was sitting. In the same way, Patroclus, when he saw the men come, stood up, and in greeting Achilles, the swift of foot, spoke to them, Welcome, you are my friends who have come, and greatly I need you, who, even to this my anger, are dearest of all Achaeans. So brilliant Achilles spoke, and guided them forward, and caused them to sit down on couches with purple coverlets, and at once called over Patchclos, who was not far from him. Son of Minoitus, set up a mixing bowl that is bigger, and mix a stronger drink, and make ready a cup for each man, since these who have come beneath my roof are the men that I love best. So he spoke, and Patroclus obeyed his beloved companion, and tossed down a great chopping block into the firelight, and laid upon it the back of a sheep and one of a fat goat, and with the chine of a fatted pig, edged thick with lard, and for him, Automedon held, held the meats, and brilliant Achilles carved them, and cut it well into pieces and spitted them, as meanwhile, Minotius' son, a man like a god, made the fire blaze greatly. But when the fire had burned itself out and the flames had died down, he scattered the embers apart and extended the spits across them, lifting them to the andirons and sprinkled the meats with divine salt. Then when he had roasted all and spread the food on the platters, Petroclos took the bread and set it out on the table in fair baskets, while Achilles served the meats. Thereafter, he himself sat over against the godlike Odysseus against the further wall and told his companion and Petroclos to sacrifice to the gods, and he threw the firstlings in the fire. They put their hands to the good things that lay ready before them, but when they had put aside their desire for eating and drinking, Aias nodded to Phoenix, and brilliant Odysseus saw it, and filled a cup with wine and lifted it to Achilles. Your health, Achilles. You have no lack of your equal portion either within the shelter of Atreus' son, Agamemnon, nor here now in your own. We have good things in abundance to feast on. Here it is not the desirable feast we think of, but a trouble all too great, beloved of Zeus, that we look on and be afraid. There is doubt if we save our strong beach bench vessels, or if they will be destroyed unless you put on your war strength. The Trojans in their pride, with their far-renowned companions, have set up an encampment close by the ships and the rampart, and lit many fires along their army, and think no longer being held, but rather to drive in upon the black ships. And Zeus, son of Cronos, lightens upon their right hand, showing the importance of good, while Hector, in the huge pride of his strength, rages irresistibly, reliant on Zeus, and gives way to no one, neither God nor man, but the strong fury has descended upon him. He prays now that the divine dawn will show most quickly, since he threatens to shear the uttermost horns from the ship's sterns, to light the ships themselves with ravening fire, and to cut down the Achaeans themselves as they stir from the smoke beside them. All this I fear terribly in my heart, lest immortals accomplish all these threats, and lest for us it be destiny to die here in Troy, far away from the horse-pasturing Argos. Up then, if you are minded, late though it be, to rescue the afflicted to you the hereafter, there will be no afflicted sons of the Achaeans from the Trojan onslaught. It will be an affliction to you hereafter. There will be no remedy found to heal the evil thing when it has been done. No, beforehand, take thought to beat the evil day aside from the Danans. Dear friend, surely thus 
your father Peleus advised you that day when he sent you away to Agamemnon from Phthia. My child, for the matter of strength, Athene and Hera will give it if it be their will. But be it yours to hold fast in your bosom the anger of the proud heart, for consideration is better. Keep from the bad complication of quarrel, and all the more for this the Argives will honor you, both the younger men and their elders. So the old man advised, but you have forgotten. Yet even now, stop and give way from the anger that hurts the heart. Agamemnon offers you worthy recompense if you change from your anger. Come then, you will listen, you will, if you will, listen to me, while I count off for you all the gifts in his shelter that Agamemnon has promised. Seven unfired tripods, ten talents weight of gold, twenty shining cauldrons, and twelve horses, strong race competitors, who have won prizes in the speed of the feet. That man would not be in poor possessions to whom were given all these have won him, nor be unpossessed of dearly honored gold, were he given all the prizes Agamemnon's horses won in their speed for him. He will give you seven women of Lesbos, the work of whose hands is blameless, whom when you yourself captured strong fan of Lesbos he chose, and who in their beauty surpassed the races of women. He will give you these, and with them shall go the one he took from you, the daughter of Briseis. And to all this he will swear a great oath, that he never entered into her bed, and never lay with her as is natural for human people between men and women. All these gifts shall be yours at once. But again, if hereafter the gods grant that we storm and sack the great city of Priam, you may go to your ship and load it deep as you please with gold and bronze when we Achaeans divide the war spoils. And you may choose for yourself twenty of the Trojan women who are the loveliest of all after Helen of Argos. And if we come back to Achaean Argos, pride of the tilled lands, you could be his son-in-law, and he would honor you with Orestes, his growing son, who is brought up there in abundant luxury. Since as he has three daughters there in his strong-built castle, Chrysothemos and Laodicea and Epinesa, you may lead away the one of these that you like, with no bride price, to the house of Peleus. And with the girl, he will grant you his dowry, many gifts, such as no man ever gave his daughter. He will grant you seven citadels, strongly settled, Cardamile and Anope, and higher of the grasses, Ferry the sacrosanct, and Nithia deep in the meadows, and Apia the lovely, and Pedasos of the vineyards. All these lie near the sea at the bottom of Sandy Pylos, and men live among them, rich in cattle and rich in sheep flocks, who will honor you as if you were a god with gifts given, and fulfill your prospering decrees underneath your scepter. All this he will bring to pass for you, if you change from your anger. But if the son of Atreus is too much hated in your heart, himself and his gifts, at least take pity on all the other Achaeans, who are afflicted along the host, and will honor you as a god, for you may win very great glory among them. For now you might kill Hector, since he would come very close to you, with the wicked fury upon him, since he thinks there is not his equal among the rest of the Danans, the ships carried hither. Then, in answer to him, spoke Achilles of the swift feet, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, without consideration for you I must make my answer, the way I think, and the way it will be accomplished, that you may not come one after another and sit by me and speak softly. For as I detest the doorways of death, I detest that man who hides one thing in the depths of his heart and speaks forth another. But I will speak to you the way it seems best to me. Neither do I think the son of Atreus, Agamemnon, will persuade me, nor the rest of the Danans, since there is no gratitude given for fighting incessantly forever against your enemies. Fate is the same for the man who holds back, the same as if he fights hard. We are all held in a single honor, the brave with the weaklings. A man still di dies still if he has done nothing, as one who has done much. Nothing is won for me, now that my heart has gone through its afflictions in forever setting my life on the hazard of battle. For as to her unwinged young ones, the mother bird brings back morsels wherever she can find them. But as for herself, it is suffering. Such was I, as I lay through all the many nights unsleeping, such as I wore through the bloody days of fighting, striving with warriors for the sake of these men's women. But I say that I have stormed from my ships twelve cities of men, and by land eleven more through the generous Troad. From all these we took forth treasures, goodly and numerous, and we would bring them back and give them to Agamemnon, Atreus' son, while he, waiting back beside the swift ships, would take them and distribute them little by little and keep many. All the other prizes of honor he gave the great men and the princes are held fast by them. But from me alone of all the Achaeans he has taken and keeps the bride of my heart. Let him lie beside her and be happy. Yet why must the Argives fight with the Trojans? And why was the son of Atreus assembled and led here these people? Was it not for the sake of lovely-haired Helen, 
Are the sons of Atreus alone among immortal men the ones who love their wives? Since any who is a good man and careful loves her who is his own and cares for her, even as I now love this one from my heart, though it was my spear that won her. Now that he has deceived me and taken from my hands my prize of honor, let him try me no more. I know him well. He will not persuade me. Let him take counsel with you, Odysseus, and the rest of the princes, how to fight the ravening fire away from his vessels. Indeed, there has been much hard work done even without me. He has built himself a wall and driven a ditch about it, making it great and wide, and fixed the sharp stakes inside it. Yet even so, he cannot hold the strength of manslaughtering Hector. And yet when I was fighting among the Achaeans, Hector would not drive his attack beyond the wall's shelter, but would come forth only so far as the Scaean gates in the oak tree. There once he endured me alone and barely escaped my onslaught. But now I am unwilling to fight against brilliant Hector. Tomorrow, when I have sacrificed to Zeus and to all the gods, and loaded well my ships and rode out onto the salt water, you will see, if you have minded to it, and if it concerns you, my ships in the dawn at sea on the Hellespont, where the fish swarm and my men manning them with good will to row. If the glorious shake of the earth should grant us a favoring passage, on the third day thereafter we might raise generous Phythia. I have many possessions there that I left behind when I came here on this desperate venture. And from and from here there is more gold and red bronze and fair girdled women, and gray iron I will take back, all that was allotted to me. But my prize, he who gave it, powerful Agamemnon, son of Atreus, has taken it back again outrageously. Go back and proclaim to him all that I tell you openly, so that other Achaeans may turn against him in anger if he hopes yet one more time to swindle some other Danaan, wrapped as he is forever in shamelessness. Yet he would not... Yet he would not, bold as, bold as a dog though he be, dare look in my face any longer. I will join with him in no counsel and in no action. He cheated me and he did and he did me hurt. Let him not beguile me with his words again. This is enough for him. Let him of his own will be damned, since Zeus the counsels has taken his wits away from him. I hate his gifts. I hold him light as a strip of a splinter. Not if he gave me ten times as much and twenty times over as he possesses now. Not if more should come to him from elsewhere, or gave all that is brought in to Orchomenos, all that is brought in to Thebes of Egypt, where the greatest possessions lie up in the houses, Thebes of the Hundred Gates, where through each of the gates two hundred fighting men come forth to war with horses and chariots. Not if he gave me gifts as many as the sand or the dust is, not even so would Agamemnon have his way with my spirit, until he had made good to me all this heart-trending insolence. Nor will I marry a daughter of Atreus' son, Agamemnon, not if she challenged Aphrodite the golden for loveliness, not if she matched the work of her hands with gray-eyed Athene, nor will I, not even so, will I marry her. Let him pick some other Achaean, one who is the, like his liking and is kinglier than I am. For if the gods will keep me alive and I win homeward, Peleus himself will presently arrange a wife for me. There are many Achaean girls in the land of Hellas and Phythia, daughters of great men who hold strong places in guard. All of these, any one that I please, I might make my beloved lady. And the great desire in my heart drives me rather in that place, to take a wedded wife in marriage, the bride of my fancy, to enjoy with her the possessions won by aged Peleus. For not worth the value of my life are all the possessions they fable, where were one for Ilion, that strong founded citadel, in the old days, when there was a peace, before the coming of the sons of the Achaeans, not all that the stone door sill of the archer holds fast within it, of Phoebus, Apollo, and Pythia the rocks, of possessions, cattle, and fat sheep are things to be had for the lifting, and tripods can be won, and the tawny high heads of horses, but a man's life cannot come back again. It cannot be lifted nor captured again by force once it has crossed the teeth barrier. For my mother, Thetis, the goddess of the silver feet, tells me, I carry two sorts of destiny toward the day of my death. Either if I stay here and fight beside the city of the Trojans, my return home is gone, and my glory shall be everlasting. But if I return home to the beloved land of my fathers, the excellence of my glory is gone, but there, there will be a long life left for me, and my end in death will not come to me quickly. And this would be my counsel to others also, to sail back home again, since no longer shall you find any term set on the sheer city of Ilion. Since Zeus of the wide brows has strongly held his, held his own hand over it, and its people are made bold. Do you go back, therefore, to the great men of the Achaeans, and take them this message, 
since such is the privilege of the princes, that they think out of out in their minds some other scheme that is better, which might rescue their ships and the people of the Achaeans, who man the hollow ships, since his plan will not work for them, which they thought of by reason of my anger. Let Phoenix remain here with us and sleep here, so that tomorrow he may come with us in our ships to the beloved land of our fathers, if he will, but I will never use force to hold him. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken to silence in amazement at his words. He had spoken to them very strongly. But at la long last, Phoenix the aged horseman spoke out in a storm burst of tears and fearing for the ships of the Chians. If it is going home, glorious Achilles, you ponder in your heart and are utterly unwilling to drive the obliterating fire from the fast ships. Since anger is descended on your spirit, how then shall I, dear child, be left in this place behind you all alone? Peleus, the aged horseman, sent me forth with you on that day when he sent you from Phythia to Agamemnon, a mere child, who knew nothing yet of the joining of battle, nor debate where men are made preeminent. Therefore he sent me along with you to teach you all these matters, to make you a speaker of words and one accomplished in action. Therefore, apart from you, dear child, I would not be willing to be left behind, not were the God in person to promise he would scale away my old age and make me a young man blossoming as I was that time when I first left Hellas, the land of fair women, running from the hatred of Omenos' son, Amnitor, my father, who hated me for the sake of a fair-haired mistress. For he made love to her himself and dishonored his own wife, my mother, who was forever taking my knees and entreating me to lie with this mistress instead, so that she would hate the old man. I was persuaded and did it, and my father, when he heard of it straight away, called down his curses and invoked against me the dreaded furies that I might never have any son born of my seed to dandle on my knees. And the divinities, Zeus of the underworld and Persephone, the honored goddess, accomplished his curses. Then I took it into my mind to cut him down with a sharp bronze, but some one of the immortals checked my anger, reminding me of rumor among the people and the men's maledictions repeated that I might not be called a par parricide among the Achaeans. But now no more could the heart in my breast be ruled entirely. To the range still among these halls, my father was angered. Rather, it was the many kinsmen and cousins about me who held me closed in the house with supplications repeated and slaughtered fat sheep in their numbers and shambling horned curved cattle and numerous swine with the fat abundant upon them were singed and stretched out across the flame of Hephaestus. And much wine was drunk that was stored in the jars of the old man. Nine nights they slept night long in their places beside me and they kept up an interchange of watches and the fire was never put out. <laughs> one below the gate of the strong closed courtyard and one in the antechamber before the doors of the bedroom but when the tenth night had come to me in its darkness then i broke the closed compacted doors of the chamber and got away and overleapt the fence of the courtyard lightly unnoticed by the guarding men and the women servants then i fled far away through the wide spaces of hellas and came as far as generous Phythia, mother of sheep flocks <laughs> and to lord peleus who accepted me with a good will and gave me his love, even as a father loves his own son, who was a single child brought up among many possessions. He made me a rich man and granted me many people, and I lived, Lord, over the Dolopes in remotest Phythia, and godlike Achilles. I made you all that you are now, and loved you out of my heart, for you would not go with another out to any feast, nor taste any food in your own halls, until I had set you on my knees, and cut little pieces from the meat, and given you all you wished, and held the wine for you. And many times you soaked the shirt that was on my body with wine that you would spit up in the troublesomeness of your childhood. So I have suffered much through you and have made and, and have had much trouble, thinking always how the gods would not bring to birth any children of my own, so that it was you, God like Achilles, I made my own child, so that some day you might keep heart affliction from me. Then Achilles beat down with your great anger. It is not yours to have a pitiless heart. The very immortals can be moved. Their virtue and honor and strength are greater than ours are. And yet with sacrifices and offerings for endearment, with libations and with savor, men turn back even the immortals in supplication when any man does wrong and transgresses. For there is also the spirits of prayer, the daughters of the great Zeus, and they are lame on their feet and wrinkled and cast their eyes sidelong, who toil on their way left far behind the spirit of ruin. But she, ruin, is strong and sound on her feet, and therefore fire out crumbs all prayers and winds into every country to force men astray. And the prayers follow her as healers after her. If a man venerates these daughters of Zeus as they draw near, such a man they might they bring great advantage. 
and hear his entreaty. But if a man shall deny them and stubbornly with a harsh word refuse, they go down to Zeus, son of Kronos, in supplication, that ruin may overtake this man, that he be hurt and punished. So, Achilles, grant you also that Zeus's daughters be given their honor, which lowly though they be, curbs to the will of others. Since were he not bringing gifts and naming still more hereafter, Atreus's sons, were he to remain still swollen with rancor, even I would not bid you throw your anger aside now, nor defend the Argives, though they needed you sorely. But see now he offers you much straight away, and has promised you more hereafter. He has sent the best men to you to supplicate you, choosing them out of the king and host, those who to yourself are the dearest of all the Argives. Do not you make vain their argument, nor their footsteps, though before this one could not blame your anger. Thus it was in the old days also, and the deeds that we hear of from the great man, when the swelling anger descended upon them, the heroes would take gifts, they would listen and be persuaded. For I remember this action of old, and it is not a new thing, and how it went, you are all my friends. I will tell it among you. The Corites and the steadfast Aetolians were fighting and slaughtering one another about the city of Caledon, and the Aetolians in lovely Caledon's defenses, the Corites furious to storm and sack it in war. For Artemis, she of the golden chair, had driven this evil upon them, angered that Onius had not given the pride of the orchids to her first fruits. The rest of the gods were given due sacrifice, but alone to this daughter of great Zeus, he had given nothing. He had forgotten or had not thought in his hard delusion and in wrath at this whole mighty line, the Lady of Arrows, sent upon him the fierce wild boar with his shining teeth, who after the way of his kind did much evil to the orchards, orchards of Onius. For he ripped up the whole tall trees from the ground and scattered them headlong, roots and all, even the very flowers of the orchid orchard. <laughs> The son of Onius killed this boar, Meliagros, assembling together many hunting men out of numerous cities with their hounds, since the boar might not have been killed by a few men, so huge was he, and it put many men on the sad fire for burning. But the goddess again made a great stir of anger and crying battle over the head of the boar and bristling boar's hide between Corites and the high-hearted Aetolians. So long as Meliagros loved her battle stayed in the fighting, it went the worse for Corites and they could not even hold their ground outside the wall, though they were so many. But when the anger came upon Meliagros, such anger as wells in the hearts of others also, though their minds are careful, he in the wrath of his heart against his own mother, Althea, lay apart with his wedded bride, Cleopatra the Lovely, daughter of the sweet-stepping Marpessa, child of Eunos and Idas, who was the strongest of all men upon earth in his time. For he even took up the bow to face the king's onset. Phoebus Apollo, for the sake of the sweet-stepping maiden, a girl her father and honored mother had named in their palace. Alcyon Seabird as, as a by-name, since for her sake her mother with the sorrow-laden cry of a seabird wept because far-reaching Phoebus Apollo had taken her. When this Cleopatra, he lay mulling his heart sore anger, raging by reason of his mother's curses, which she called down from the gods upon him, in deep grief for the death of her brother and many times beating with her hands on the earth abundant, she called on Hades and an honored Persephone, lying at length on along the ground, and the tears were wet on her bosom to give death to her son. And Aries, the mist-walking she of the heart without pity, heard her out of the dark places. Presently there was thunder about the gates, and the sound rose of towers under assault, and the Aetolian elders supplicated him, sending their noblest priests the immortals to come forth and defend them, they offered him a great gift, wherever might lie the richest ground and lovely Caledon. There they told him to choose out of a piece of land, an entirely good one, of fifty acres, the half of it to be vineyard, and the half of it to unworked plow land of the plain to be furrowed. And the aged horseman, Onius again and again, entreated him, and took his place at the threshold of the high vaulted chamber, and shook against the bolted doors, pleading with his own son. And again and again his honored mother and his sisters entreated him. But he only refused the more. Then his own friends, who were the most honored and dearest of all, entreated him. But even so, they could not persuade the heart within him, until, as the chamber was under the close assault, the Corites were mounting along the towers and set fire to the great city. And then at last his wife, the fair girdled bride, supplicated Milagros in tears, and rehearsed in their numbers before him all the sorrows that come to men when their city is taken. They kill the men, and the fire leaves the city in ashes, and strangers lead the children away, and the deep-girdled women, and as a heart, as he listened to all his evil, was stirred within him, 
and he rose and went and closed his body in shining armor. So he gave way in his own heart and drove back the day of evil from the Aetolians. Yet these no longer would make good their many and gracious gifts, yet he drove back the evil from them. Listen then, do not have such a thought in your mind. Let not the spirit within you turn or that you turn you that way, dear friend. It would be worse to defend the ships after they are burning. No, with gifts promised, go forth. The Achaeans will honor you as they would an immortal. But if without gifts you go into the fighting where men perish, your honor will no longer be as great, though you drive back the battle. Then, in answer to him, spoke Achilles of the swift beat. Phoenix, my father, aged and illustrious, such honor is a thing I need not. I think I am honored already in Zeus's ordinance, which will hold me here beside my curved ships as long as life's wind stays in my breast. As long as my knees have their spring beneath me, and put away in your thoughts this other thing I tell you. Stop confusing my heart with lamentation and sorrow for the favor of great Atreides. Atreides. It does not become you to love this man, for fear you turn hateful to me who love you. It should be your pride with me to hurt whoever shall hurt me. Be king equally with me. Take half of my honor. These men will carry back the message. You stay here and sleep here in a soft bed, and we shall decide tomorrow, as dawn shows, whether we go back home again or else to remain here. He spoke and saying nothing, nodded with his brows to Patroclus and to make up a neat bed for Phoenix, so the others might presently think of going home from his shelter. The son of Telamon, Aias the godlike, saw it, and now spoke his word among them. Son of Latrius and seed of Zeus, resourceful as Odysseus, let us go. I think that nothing will be accomplished by argument on this errand. It is best to go back quickly and tell this story, though it is not good to the Danans who sit there waiting for us to come back, seeing that Achilles has made savage the proud-hearted spirit within his body. He is hard, and he does not remember that friend's affection wherein we honored him by the ships far beyond all others. Pitiless, and yet a man takes from his brother's slayer the blood price, or the price for a child who was killed, and the guilty one when he has largely repaid stays still in the country, and the injured man's heart is curbed and his pride and his anger when he has taken the price. But the gods put in your breast a spirit not to be placated, bad for the sake of one single girl. Yet now we offer you seven, surpassingly lovely, and much beside these. Now, now make gracious the spirit within you. Respect your own house. See, we are under the same roof with you. For the multitude of the Danans, who, we who desire beyond all the others to have your honor and love out of all the Achaeans. Then in answer to him spoke Achilles of the swift feet. Son of Telamon, seed of Zeus, I ask, Lord of the people, all that you have said seems spoken after my own mind. Yet still the heart in me swells up in anger when I remember the disgrace that he wrought upon me before the Argives, the son of Atreus, as if I were some dishonored vagabond. Do you then go back to him and take him this message, that I shall not think again of the bloody fighting until such a time as the, wise, as the son of wise Priam Hector the Brilliant comes all the way to the ships of the Myrmidons and their shelters, slaughtering the Argives and shall darken with fire our vessels. But around my own shelter, I think, and beside my black ship, Hector will be held, though he be very hungry for battle. He spoke, and taking each a two-handled cup, poured out a libation, then went back to the ships, and Odysseus led them. Now Patroclus gave the maids and his followers orders to make up without delay a neat bed for Phoenix. And these obeyed him and made up the bed as he had commanded, laying fleeces on it, and a blanket and a sheet of fine linen. There the old man lay down and waited for the divine dawn. But Achilles slept in the inward corner of the strong-built shelter, and a woman lay beside him, one he had taken from Lesbos, Forbus's daughter, Diomede of the fair coloring. In the other corner, Patroclus went to bed. With him also was a girl, Iphis the fair girdled, whom brilliant Achilles gave him when he took sheer Skyros, Aeneas of Citadel. Now when these had come back to the shelters of Agamemnon, the sons of Achaeans greeted them with their gold cups uplifted, one after another, standing and asked them questions. All the first to question them was the lord of men, Agamemnon. Tell me, honored Odysseus, great glory of the Achaeans, is he willing to fight the ravening fire away from our vessels, or did he refuse, or, and does the anger still hold his proud heart? Then, long-suffering, great Odysseus spoke to him and answered, Son of Atreus, most lordly king of men, Agamemnon, that man will not quench his anger, but still more than ever is filled with rage. He refuses you and refuses your presence. 
He tells you yourself to take counsel among the Argives how to save your ships and the people the Kians. And he himself has threatened that tomorrow, as dawn shows, he will drag down his strong bench or swept ships to the water. He said it would be his counsel to others also to sail back home again, since no longer will you find any terms set on the sheer city of Ilion, since Zeus of the Wide Brows has strongly held his own hand over it, and its people are made bold. So he spoke. There are these to attest to it who went there with me. Also I asked, and these two heralds, both men of good counsel. But aged Phoenix stayed there for the night, as Achilles urged him, so he might go home in the ships to the beloved land of his fathers, if Phoenix will. But he will never use force to persuade him. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken to silence, in amazement at his words. He had spoken to them very strongly. For a long time the sons of the Achaeans said nothing, in sorrow. But at long last Diomedes of the great war cry spoke to them. Son of Atreus, most lordly and king of men, Agamemnon, I wish you had not supplicated the blameless son of Peleus, with the numerable gifts, offer, numerable gifts offered. He is a proud man without this, and now you have driven him far deeper into his pride. Rather, we shall pay him no more attention. Rather, we shall pay him no more attention, whether he comes in with us or stays away. He will fight again whenever the time comes. Then the heart in his body urges him to, and the God drives him. Come then, do as I say, and let us all be won over. Go to sleep, now that the inward heart is made happy with food and drink, for these are the strength and courage within us. But when the lovely dawn shows forth with rose fingers, I treaties rapidly form before our ships, both people and horses, stirring them on, and yourself be ready to fight in the foremost. So he spoke, and all the kings gave their approval, acclaiming the word of Diomedes, breaker of horses. Then they poured a libation, and each man went to his shelter, where they went to their beds and took the blessing of slumber.